Hello, Tom Levecchia here with a very special live edition of the Armchair MBA. Today, I have a very special guest, somebody that I've been following, I've been watching. Shout out to Adrian, Invest in Yourself Clothing. That's where I first saw Derek. And then I've been following him on Instagram since. I've been following him copiously, invited him on the show. Derek is uh, an author. He wrote a book. It's called Greed and Fear, the Galanis Crime Family. He's an MMA fighter. He wrote another book about MMA. Um, he was a former Gambino associate. An operative word is Gambino, which we'll get into. The real Gambinos, the Cherry Hill Gambinos. And then on top of it, um, got involved with white collar crime and some crazy stuff. Derek Lannis, welcome to the Armchair MBA. How are you doing today, buddy? Good, Tom. How are you? It's my pleasure. So we're going to jump right in. Give us about you know where you grew up and... Uh, then kind of lead into your father, because his father, again, there's a lot to unpack here, was basically the original Bernie Madoff. So give us kind of where you grew up and like what it was like to grow up with your father. Yeah, well, I mean, for those who, who know my background, they're going to kind of smile. Like, I grew up right right next to New York in Greenwich, Connecticut. And, right. you know, for those of you who aren't, aren't you know, from back east in the Tri-State area, Greenwich is like the Beverly Hills yep. of uh, of the East Coast. Um, so yeah, I mean, I was definitely silver spoon in mouth up until I was 14 years of age. And, and why was that? Because my father was the Bernie Madoff of the eighties, you know, today, even at his most recent trial, prosecutors called him, uh, one of the top 10 white collar criminals of all time. And wow. he caught a Rico indictment because Giuliani was in the office and he was using that Rico on not just the mob, but anybody he could, I uh, gave my dad 27 years. Um, and we migrated to California because my dad had some time to do. Um, so yeah, that that's my original background. So you 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 so a lot of what's interesting, you know this. A lot of people that commit these financial like crimes, like a Madoff, like your father, etc., they're not like street people. They're intelligent people. They do well for themselves. For some reason, they think they can cut corners or do stuff uh, to get wealthier. Give me just kind of like how your father was before the scam. Like, was he a wealthy guy? Like, was he, you know, just give us a little background. And then why do you think he did it? Yeah, you know, listen, so, you know, when you're on Wall Street, the only yeah. thing is greed and fear. And that's why I, you know, named my book Greed yeah. and Fear. You know, uh, you know, how much money do you want and what are you willing to do to get it? You know, how afraid yeah. are you to break the law? I would get my father, I, that my father basically had no fear. Um, you know, he didn't care. Money was the prime object for him and the most amount of money possible. Um, so, you know, at, in fact, Giuliani said something that was very funny around his 86 trial. He said, uh, John Galanis is a career white collar criminal because my father had his first bid back in the late 1960s. Yeah. Um, and, you know, at that time, you know, and we learn a lot about people in society as time goes on. I think people thought, you know, white collar people who got in trouble were so intelligent and sophisticated, they would just stop. And that was before an appreciation of the fact that, you know, greed afflicts us all. And right. guess what? Some people never lose their greed and lessons like prison don't take. Um, you know, I think Bernie Madoff's a prime example. You know, we put him in what a total position of power. He was I think he was the head of NASDAQ at one yeah, time. Or one NASDAQ of these compliance or something crazy. Yeah. 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 And, you know, and and so in that sense, they treated Madoff like a dirty cop. You know, as right. dirty cops might get a lot of time because they're like, you've, you've defiled the institution. Right, That's correct. what Madoff did. Now, up until Madoff, I think my father was probably the biggest defiler. He knew all the secrets and he wasn't afraid to keep on doing them over and over and over again. Um, and it's just, you know, I, I, what can I tell you? I guess his greed was way higher than his fear. Interesting. Derek, did you know uh, Janet Stein, Stein, Steinmeier from Connecticut, by chance? No, I mean, so one of the things uh, I think every, all your listeners should know is like, remember, no. I moved away from Connecticut at 14 years old. Um, so, you know, my contacts with people, whether I met her or knew her back then, I might have, but, you know, I've lived six lives since then. I've done two prison bids. You know, yeah. I grew up effectively in Southern California. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I'm so removed from all of that. If I did know her, I wouldn't even remember. Got it. Okay. So you're in essence, a, a good kid. You grew up in, in, in Greenwich, you know, your father gets jammed up. 
obviously, and, and you know this, back then the sentences were very light. For him to get 27 years obviously was a big deal. Commit some fraud. Uh, you know, Giuliani makes an example out of him. You move out to the you know West Coast. Give us how you acclimated and then kind of like how you started your life, regular life, and how did you get into crime? Well, I, I think the most important thing that people need to realize, and this this is very common for anyone who gets busted, you know, and I know when the feds come in, look, if you've lived a life of privilege, if you were a drug dealer's kid or a white collar guy's kid or anybody else, that life ends, right? And so we didn't have any money. You know, um, we essentially went to, we, we were in private school still, but it was on financial aid, which yeah. is a real embarrassment for our family with how they had acted. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I had nothing. And uh, by the time I turned 18, I hit the streets. You know, I said, okay, I'm, I got I to gotta do something to make money. My brother yeah. went my father's way. But everything in me said my father was not the way I wanted to go. Let me make my own way. Um, and I found out how ugly those streets were. And after about three years, I veered back into my, my father's orbit. Little did I know, the streets to. probably would have been less time in prison than my father. That's crazy. So, so Derek, so, you know, as kids, we're not able to think globally, right? So if you're, you know, 12 year old, 13 year old, daddy goes to jail. Oh my God. Kind of a big deal. Right. It was a big deal. But then like you move to California and you know what? You don't get, you know, Hey, remember we used to eat out every night. You can't, you know, you had to make life adjustments, but you were a kid. You kind of didn't understand. How did your mother and how did your family kind of say to you? Like, we're screwed here. And like, you know, you're going to get a little less than you did. And how did you transition with that? Well, you know, listen, it was never very difficult for me because money was not the top of my, you know, uh, list. Yeah, yeah, Unfortunately yeah. for my mother and my older brother, it certainly was. Got it. Um, and I, so I think the, the volatility in the house between those two with the new circumstances was very difficult. I was always sort of the peacemaker. Yeah. I was the guy who took the rap for anything in the family. And, and I, I continue that into my adulthood. Um, there was a lot of violence in my home, which I think, uh, you know, was, I, I don't know what to say about that. There's a, there's a lot of violence in a lot of criminal yeah. zones, yeah. um, you know, and uh, you know, my father didn't see fit to rear, uh, rear it in. He let it go because he was so angry at my mother, angry at my, you know, his circumstances. But the truth is my father had no one to blame for his circumstances, but himself. Um, and I just think that some people are wired that way, you know, especially sociopaths. They're only interested in what's going on for them, you know. Um, and my father was was definitely a sociopath. So, you know, for me, the transition was probably easier than for them. Um, but at the same time, I had to deal with their rocky transition. And that was not easy. Yeah. Now, we're not going to give it away what happened with you and your brother and father later on. But just we're building up to your teens. In your teens, were you close? Your father wasn't around, right? Were you getting? Were you close to your brother at least early on? No, I mean my brother Jason. Uh, he's a sociopath in the mold of my father. Um, and he, he eventually used that in the same way my father did, like in financial crimes. And you know, my father was not a handsome man. He looks a lot like me. My older brother looks like a fashion model. Um, and that obviously is very helpful in many areas of life. Um, and we'll get into that later when we talk about yeah. some other things. But yeah, um, when my brother was young, he was very hard on me. And, you know, you mentioned my martial arts background on the yeah. role. And I find that many people who are lifetime martial artists, there was a lot of violence in their home. I mean, my brother pummeled me, you know, with no remorse. Um, and, you know, I probably could have taken him by the time I was, you know, 13 or 14, but some, something in my head said, this is my brother. You know, I, I can't hurt my brother. Um, little did I know, you know, when I finally beat him up, I was 19 years old. He never touched me again. I, I wish I had done it when I was younger. So going to roll right into it. And um, I, I was saying earlier, uh, Derek and I were chatting. Um, anybody watches the show, anybody who knows me, I know a fair amount about organized crime and history. One of my blind spots has been and always has and continues to be la so you meet the gambinos which is like kind of like you know you met you know the administration level type people give us who did you meet first and how did that happen sure so my father was in the la prison terminal mm -hmm. island 
Yeah. Um, and uh, this is after bouncing around. He was in Arizona for a while. He was in Northern California for a little while. And then he finally landed at TI, which back then was a medium prison. Okay. Um, and who was at that medium prison with him? Rosario Gambino. Oh. Um, and Rosario also happened to have, he had two daughters too, but he had two sons who were very, very close in age to my brother and me. I think they were a little younger than us, but the space between them was basically the same dynamic. Um, yeah. And by the way, on that note, the older son of Rosario's, Tommy, was very much like Jason in that Tommy was incredibly handsome. He was short like Rosario, but yeah. you know, for a wise guy, very charming. Was that, was that the one... Who tried to use Clinton's uh, half brother or step brother to get him pardoned? You I bet it was. You bet it yeah. was. And you know, listen. So, I, you know, my father. We're going fast forward in years, but you know, my father eventually went on the run, and we met with Tommy Gambino in Southern California. And Tommy relayed to us a whole meeting between him, Bill Clinton, and Hillary Clinton in a Washington parking garage. Um, and discussing, you know, getting Rosario parole. That was the discussion. Wow. Now, you know, listen, the feds know this because they were listening to us on wiretap at the time because I had a drug case coming up. Um, they buried that just like they buried the future hunter stuff. Uh, they don't they don't want to deal with it. They don't want to touch it. Jesus. Uh, the, the more the more the more I, I put my hand in, the more dirt I see, you know, in the swamp. So okay. So first, let's start off with, you know, tell me about Rosario, you know, short, kind of meager in shape, but a meager Sicilian gentleman. If you saw him on the street or a pizzeria, you probably wouldn't give him a second glance, but was arguably one of the most important traffickers uh, uh, in the 80s, maybe 90s, and probably one of the most important mafioso in Gambino history. So tell us a little about Rosario, Rosario before we get into the sun. Well, I mean, the first thing I should say is, you know, I idolize Rosario. Okay. Um, to me, he was always Mr. Gambino. Um, yeah, he, he did look like a bodybuilder. You know, I've been in yeah. their yeah, apartment. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, I, that's what prison does to you, yeah, right? I mean, yeah. according to Tommy, Rosario didn't work out on the streets. I, I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, partly that might be because Tommy didn't want to work out. Yeah. Um, but Rosario sounded like, you know, from a kid from Greenwich, Rosario sounded like, Mario and Mario Brothers. He had That's a great. very, very thick Italian accent, yeah. um, but he was always very gentlemanly, um, you know, and, and very clearly what Rosario was doing in Terminal Island was hooking up his progeny, Tony and Tommy, with all the fellows who might help them learn how to make money in the world. Yeah. Um, and certainly my father was one of those. Nice. Now, so that's Rosario. We'll get the timing a little bit. So you're, you know, you're 18, you're in the street, you're in LA. I know it's different than New York. LA is a different composition, but were you introduced to the, you know, LA organized crime scene through Rosario and Tommy, or did you kind of find it on your own and then kind of it like merge later on? So, okay. So let me qualify first of all. So my, my brother moved to LA, uh, mm -hmm. my family and me were in San Diego. Mm -hmm. So the next is the Gambinos were always in LA themselves. Um, most of the street stuff I did in San Diego was totally and completely apart to anything to do with Ooh, the Gambino. They had nothing to do with them. Um, when I when I met them, I had come back into my father's fold, and my father desperately, you know, was courting the Gambinos. And I think part of that is this: look, he knew who they were, just like you know who they are. Uh, mm. It seems strange that the rest of the world doesn't know that family and how powerful. Yep. Indeed, they are. Yep. Um, but my father knew, look, there's money to be made here. Meaning, you know, in his day, you're talking the 80s and 70s, a Gambino could go into a restaurant and say, hey, by the way, your vending machines and phones, Correct. we're putting them in from now on. That's the way Correct. it's going to be. Correct. You know, and by the way, that's the business Tommy was in when when I met him. He was in the phone, of the pay phone installation business. Now, the irony, of course, of that is cell phones were just coming out. You know, it was the 90s. Correct, so poor correct. Tommy had chosen the absolutely wrong yeah. business, but it yeah. didn't matter. You know, he edged along and he kept yeah. going. Well, one story, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but I think I got to yeah. tell this story because it's funny. You know, I was a professional fighter back then, but I was yeah. a kickboxer because MMA wasn't very big. It was in the yeah. I had seen a couple fights in Vegas with Tommy. Um, I think we saw a De La Hoya fight because one of the Goosen's gophers 
was in prison with Rosario, my father, and got us tickets. But, um, you know, Tommy used to always make fun of the fighters. Like, ah, yeah, he's just a boxer. Who is he? And I brought to my father and Rosario and Tommy, we had to sit down at Terminal Island. I said, look, the UFC is going to be huge. You know, if we yes. if we move on this thing right now, we can be richer than we ever dreamed. And my father continued to tell me how stupid I was. And I couldn't see it. And I didn't know what I was doing. And needless to say, we didn't get into that. <laughs> and, the, and the irony, and the irony is, it was purchased by the Fertitti brothers, who another prominent family who's related to the Maceos or the Macheos from Galveston. So it's kind of funny that the Gambinos could have picked it up, but the Galveston guys picked that up. So, okay. So, 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 and there wasn't, um, there wasn't much, you know, you were a street guy in San Diego. There wasn't much going on in San Diego as far as LCN, correct? I think it was. No, wrong, it? I mean, listen, the, the LA crime family, like when I met the Gambinos, yeah. I started to get to know the hierarchy. Like Pete Milano was in Terminal Island for a time with them. And Milano was the boss of L.A. for decades and yeah. decades. Yeah. Um, and, you know, Rosario had his sons made under the L.A. crime family. See, I and, didn't know that. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, so, yeah. look, in, in a really kind of way, our fathers both knew something. Like, our time in New York was done. And what Rosario knew was, if I leave my family back here, Tommy and Tony, especially Tony, who was, who was more of a wild kind of guy, are yeah. going to get into some stupid, stupid street stuff. Correct. So he moves them to L.A. to remove them from any of that influence, Got any it. of that stuff where they can be dragged in. And in doing so, you know, integrates them with the L.A. crime family that Pete's in, yeah. gets them made. Tommy becomes Pete's underboss. And it was a way to keep his traditions going, but keep his family safe at the same time. Interesting. So I heard two things. I heard... There is an L.A. crime family, you know, still probably 10 guys or whatever's left. And they were the former Dragna family. They were represented by Chicago or whatever. At one point, one to Chicago. And then nowadays are basically a satellite crew of the Gambinos. So I heard that their own family or a satellite crew of the New York Gambinos. Which do you think is closer to the truth? Well, so it's funny, you know, people say that. And, and so it, it, it takes on a double meaning here. And let's bring this up. So we know that John, who's Rosario's brother, Correct. was on the ruling council of the Gambinos in New York, Correct. right? Correct. We also know that Frank Cali married into the Inzerillos. And I know yeah. I, I've talked to some of Frank's kids on TikTok following me, and they've they've talked about John being there. I think the word is Nanu in, in Italian, right? Yeah. Grandfather. Yeah. So, you know, by blood. The Sicilians, through Frank Cali, who was, you know, their American proxy, if you will, yeah. took over the Gambinos there. Correct. Through Tommy being Pete's underboss out there, they took over L.A. Yeah. So you could say the Sicilians the sort of had control of that. Now, listen, Tommy yeah. bounced around with that guy, Donnie, I forget his last name, who was a Columbo. Um, LA yes, is, yes, yes, yes. He was a big shot. He, he was right? Going Dating, I think, uh, Hurley, Elizabeth Hurley, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know you're talking so, about. So I'll tell you a story about that guy. Yeah. It's pretty funny. So Tony and I are partying in L.A. one night, and Tony decides he wants to drive my Tahoe. I said, okay. So we're coming out of one of the clubs, Roxbury or whatever it was. I can't even remember. And Tony <laughs> sideswipes this car, and then he decides he's going to make a go for it and run away, right? So he peels out, and they start following us. And Tony goes, Derek, we got to beat up these guys. I'm like, all right, well, whatever, Tony, you're going to do, I'm going to back your play. Tony pulls over and we both jump out of the car. Mm. Uh, the girls in the car get out, but Tony, uh, but the guys don't, right? They don't want any problems. Then the girl suddenly realizes who Tony is because of how he's talking and, and what he says to them. And, and she goes, oh, my God, are you guys with Donnie? And Tony says, yeah, Donnie's my uncle or whatever he says. So then the cops pull up oh, and they want to know what happened. And the cops take both their IDs. They see Gambino's ID. I can tell you this. We were both drunk as skunks. They let us go. No wow. questions asked. Wow. Go ahead. Sorry we stopped you. Sorry we even mean... bothered you. And, you know, <laughs> listen, when that happens, what's happening is there's bigger cases. The feds are saying to the street cops, by computer, obviously, do not 
mess with these guys. We're about to let them fall into their own trap. You don't yeah. touch them. And so it was like, the funniest thing I'd ever seen in my life. But yeah, they let us go. And then the next day, with Tommy and Tony, like me and Tony were in trouble. We had to sit down with those girls and with Donnie and, and Tommy. And, you know, they berated us, made us look like idiots. And then then Donnie and Tommy went away with the two girls. <laughs> Wow, that's a, yeah, there you go. There you go. That's one way to do it. All right. So now you're in LA. You're kind of hanging out with the Gambi the Gambino guys. Um, how is Tommy Gambino? Yeah, how can you describe him? So you know, uh like I said, he's very charming and he's very yeah. very good looking, right? Um, but you know, whenever I try to to make it on a man level with him, like you know, talk like you would with your friends, if you will, he shut that down very quickly. Yeah. Um. It's just, I think Tommy is very uptight. Now, Tony's the absolutely opposite personality. Yeah. You know, Tony and I, we, we, we were very close and very similar in our roles for our family, muscle, if you will. So, you know, we got along really well. But Tom, Tommy was a hard personality. But I imagine just like my brother, you know, my brother, unless you break through his skin, very difficult to talk to. Yeah. Now, um, Tommy, I think, I think, if you're causing all sure, depending which family, depending which area, I think obviously there's some LCN in LA, but my understanding they're like 80% legitimate. You know what I mean? Like they're kind of in the fabric of society. They have a little bit of muscle, a little bit of power, kind of doing some sketchy shit, but they kind of made their money. So they don't want to fuck it up. Right. How did Tommy so, make it? Yeah. How did Tommy go ahead, Derek? Yeah, no. So listen, uh, my, what my book is about yeah. It's about the new form of organized crime. And I'll tell you yeah. something Rosario said to my father um, in Terminal Island. He said, Johnny, there's no way that you're going to convince kid to become a soldier when he can open a pizza parlor now and make 300 grand a year. You know, yeah. how are you going to get that? Back when Rosario was dealing smack, you know, yeah. money like that was not easy to come by, right? Yeah. It was very yeah. easy to get soldiers because there was need. Um, now, you know, people want to say like, well, who's in the LA crime family? I got news for you. It only needs one member, Tommy yeah. Gambino, the boss. Yeah. It, soldiers in modern organized crime, soldiers, look, if you have a traditional family, like back in New York, they're all rats. Cootie, the example is that I'm going to be on tomorrow with you. Yeah. Look, he rolled. I mean, I don't know the guy yeah. personally. And by yeah. the way, I'm not saying he is, he is evil for rolling. Yeah. I personally chose not to. That's a personal yeah. choice. Um, but you know, modern organized crime, any soldier is just someone who wants to get rich. So they use people as they need to. Now, listen, we all know Tommy's in the wine business. Have right. you That's also right. noticed that Michael Francis is suddenly in the wine business? <laughs> you know, they're both in LA together. And, and let me say uh -oh. that. Yeah, right? So it didn't take me long to figure that out. By the way, you know, Michael Francis was Rosario Selly when he was in TI. Really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, you know, Pete Milano was still there. And, there, you know, Michael's got a story he talks about where a black kid punched him in the back of the head. But the black kid thought he was someone else, supposedly. Ooh. You know, Milano went crazy. He's like, we, we can't let them do this to us here. And, you know, Michael, being a very calm guy, said, no, look, Pete. It was an accident, case of mistaken identity, leave it alone. But listen, I am sure Michael Francis is in the wine business because Tommy told him to get in the wine business. Now, when we talk about organized crime, yeah, we can say they're legit. That's what they would say. But let sure. me say something else. I guarantee you those wine businesses aren't making any money. What they are doing is they're using their star power and their mafia connections to raise money for yeah. what are legitimate fronts but yeah. they're never going to make any money with that. And it's, it's, like, a lo it's like a loss leader. It's like a loss leader or yeah. they use their connections to make money. Meaning all of a sudden they have, they're in every wine table in Sicily or there, you know what I mean? So it's either they, they, they lose money on it to make money other ways. They, they, ha they How's that know? happen though? I know Tommy said he wants them to people to say, I want to order a Gambino, like make it a name thing. But has that really happened? I mean, have you ever tried Gambino wine? I haven't. Not just that, I, I'm a little bit of a wine guy. I never had it, but I understand that like just kind of doing a Prosecco, which is like a niche of a niche. Like you need like six, like, like skews to even get in the game. You need a Cabernet, you need a, 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 a Rosé maybe nowadays. You need a, you know what I mean? A, 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 I don't know, a Cabernet Sauvignon. And they just have a Prosecco. 
so yeah, I kind of find that oddly interesting, and uh, I'm happy that um, um, you know. Well, I'm happy listen, that, so yeah. so Tom, I you look Rosario coached his kids very young. Like I remember we were going out to see Benny Binion, the grandson of the gangster. Oh yeah, you know, yeah, right. So me and Tony are on our way. And, you know, Tony wasn't sophisticated like Tommy was. He yeah. always had some hustle, and he goes, "You know what I'm going to do, Derek? I'm going to I'm going to pitch him my coffee company." I'm like. Oh, really? Tony, what's your coffee company? And he goes, G Coffee. Then we get a little little further down the road. He goes, it's actually named Cafe Imports. So so t- Tony's inventing this coffee company because he knows that, like, if he gets a contract from yeah, Benyon Hotel, yeah. Yeah. you know, and by the way, so that's, the, and they, by the way, they say they're legitimate. Yeah, okay, yeah. I get it. You know, but it's it's really like my father. It's underground financier type, you know, uh, yeah, type type crimes. Now, what about um, what about the Gambitos themselves? When they were here in New Jersey, um, they were obviously very wealthy men, very wealthy immigrants, but they didn't necessarily flaunt their wealth. They, they lived in a neighborhood that was kind of like uh, annexed off a little bit with a you know, nice houses, nothing crazy. They had, you know, Valentino's nightclub. They had a you know, supper club. Uh, 18th Avenue, I think it was Cafe Giardino. But like they weren't really like they weren't really flexing too much. How do they live in L.A. as far as you saw? No, very, very undercover. I'll tell you this. And, and this has something to do with the, the Sicilian clannish thing. Look, the whole family lived in one house, uh, yeah. one apartment, I should say, on Wils- Wilshire Boulevard. And, yeah. you know, I would have never seen that. You know, Tommy wouldn't have brought me up, brought me up there, just like Jason wouldn't have brought someone around where we lived. Um, you know, showing weakness about, you know, what was going on. Um, look, they were on Wilshire, which is a very expensive area. The apartment was big enough to house all of them. And that was two daughters at the time, a mother and two sons. So were they living high on the hog? No, but they were in the best, best area, best area codes. They were, um, you know, wearing the best clothing and whatnot. Um, so yeah, and they were hustling. They were learning how to make money. And you know, one of the guys he learned from was my father. I mean, one of the things I outline in the book. So I get busted and go away for the ecstasy lab. My brother and Tommy Gambino together. Tommy acting as a sales force. My brother acting as investment banker team. Uh, floated Penthouse International. That was the last legs of Bob Guccione's empire. You know, really? you think about the timing around 2000, 2001, right? Internet decimated print porn. So right. Guccione's on his last legs. Jason convinces him, hey, I've got a shelf for you. As everybody knows, that's the biggest scam on Wall Street, right? A reverse merger into a shell and, you know, yeah. we'll do this, we'll do that. Well, nobody ends yeah. up doing anything. You know, they're all yeah. pump and dumps for the benefit of, of uh, you know, the guys pulling off the scam. Now, right. in this case, it was Tommy Gambino and my brother, Jason. Tommy had New York brokerage houses working for him. So they sold off Penthouse and my brother convinced Guccione to do it. And my brother took care of the fake accounting to make Penthouse look palatable to investors. So, yeah, I mean, and by the way, that was another case. Never charged. My brother got a bar from the SEC, but there was no time given to anyone. Interesting. So, okay, so go, let's get to the nuts and balls. I put a link to your book for those watching on the pre-record. And even when you're watching now, I'm going to have a link in the description to get Derek's book. I have it. I have it ordered. I'm waiting for my copy. I was excited to have him on. I'll probably have him on again when I, cause I'll probably have a lot of questions. So your old man was doing his thing, committing the financial fraud. Then he's got to hanging out with a lot of these wise guys. Did he do business with these guys when he got out or did he kind of, you know, or he just kind of hung around with them? Your father. Okay, so remember one thing about, you know, my father's a child of the 70s and 80s, right, in yeah. the 60s too. So back then, you know, if you were a big-time fraud guy like my father, yeah. you're going to pay somebody, right? So who was my father paying? Okay, my father's scam was called Boardwalk Marketplace, which yes. kind of makes me smile because – I remember that. Talking- yeah. Can you go to that? Can you go – Finish your answer and then go into that scam because that's fucking insane what he did. Yeah, no, I, I think it's great because, you know, p- my, people might not have known what, what we meant, but today everybody's probably seen Boardwalk Empire with Nucky Thompson. Um, And, you know, in Boardwalk Empire, you see Atlantic City in its heyday, right? When there was yeah. cotton candy and Ferris wheels and people walked in the boardwalk. Well, I don't need to tell you that. You know, when you went to Atlantic City in the 70s and 80s, it yeah. was the worst ghetto. I mean, worse than inner city New York. Correct. Bad. 
Yeah. Um, you know, and look, that that was my father's dream of Boardwalk Marketplace. It was, look, we're going to make it like the times of Nucky Thompson. We're going to bring families back. We're going to make it a Las Vegas on the East Coast. But the financial mechanism is what really did it. If you think about the timing, right, the 80s or early 80s, uh, we had just gone through stagflation, right? So yeah. what did Reagan do? Reagan made four to one tax shelters. What does that mean? Means you convince rich people to come off their money by saying, don't worry, if you lose your money, you're going to get four times that in tax savings. You know, it creates velocity of money and, and yeah. hopefully gets the economy running again. Um, yeah. You know, because we had a stagnant economy with high inflation, which hadn't been seen before. Um, and by the way, the, the principal idea behind that is not wrong. The problem is you got guys like my father, it gives them a license to steal, right? They go around to a bunch of rich guys and they say, I got a deal you can't, you can't lose on. Correct. You invest $100,000 with me. But better than that, you don't even have to invest it. I'm going to borrow it from the bank I have. All you have to do is be a, a credit signer on this. So sign your name, Mr. Oh, Millionaire, and yeah. then you'll get four to one tax savings if we lose. But I think we're going to make you, I don't know, $5 million or whatever. So everybody says, what? I don't have to put up any money. This sounds like the greatest thing. So he signed up. Yeah. My dad raised $400 million that way Jesus. to renovate uh, the boardwalk. In, in Lake City. Now, needless to say, that money was going into our lifestyle. It was not going into boardwalks in Atlantic City. But who controlled Atlantic City in those days? You, you know, oh, you're a mob guy. It was Philly. Yeah. Philly was right by them. So my dad was paying the Philadelphia crime family um, for that deal. Millions and millions of dollars. And by the way, for street guys, that was big money. For Philly, course, that even was back big then, money. Even back then. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, so um, yeah. that, that's where that's where my dad, I think, got his first real taste of the mafia off of Wall Street. Um, you get big enough, they're going to come knocking on your door. I mean, there were I remember some incidents in Greenwich like there was a guy I was too young and they, they told me I didn't understand it. There was a black guy that was casing our house. And the cops, you know, got him. They pulled him over and said, well, what are you doing? The guy had a long string for arson. Well, that was Philadelphia saying, hey, John. Oh, no. And, you know, I didn't understand as a little kid. I thought people lit houses on fire because they wanted <laughs> to see the fire. Sure. I didn't, I didn't right, understand yeah. what was going on. Yikes. All right. So before we graduate from that, because I have one last question. Actually, two questions. But for, the first one is um, that actually seemed like a legitimate, plausible message and a legitimate project. Was this something your father intended to do? but just mismanaged it or that was just never going to happen. Well, let's, let's be honest. Okay. So my father's greed is over, over the top, but yeah. all of these deals of these underground financiers sounds great. Prosecco wine, order me a Gambino. Sounds legitimate, right? Well, I could see that all these things. And by the way, the more real and amazing it looks, the bigger the fraud is, you know, people put more and more money into it. And listen, Guys, rich guys love wise guys. You know how, how Tommy raised that money for that wine company? I mean, I don't know, but I don't need to know. Some rich guy who sees this young go getting wise guy wants to, wants to be associated with the Gambinos, yep. gives him money. Yeah, I I, uh, I see that. I see that where people think it's cool to, even nowadays in wealthier neighborhoods, kind of think it's cool to hang out with the wise guy. Okay, so your father gets jammed up. He goes away, does gets involved with everything, right? And then he goes away. You are growing up now. When did you first start getting into, were you a street guy, got into white collar crime, or did you, you know, slow down with the street stuff, get into white collar, and then want to know how you kind of got jammed up in your case? Well, so I was a street kid because we had no money, right? And yeah. And there was nothing going on, and it was really ugly in my house and I was selling drugs and yeah. really partying and living that kind of life. Um, but I really saw how ugly the street was because you know, look, the street is, uh, you know, wall street at least has veneers in front of it. Right. Even though it's as scummy as the street is. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, I ran back to my family after I realized how tough the streets were, yeah. What I didn't recognize is I was, you know, going from the, the fire, the frying pan into the fire, the fire you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, and you know, look, so I was working in one of my father's financial scams and he sent a guy home from terminal Island named Dennis Alba. Now Alba wasn't a mob guy, but he was Italian. 
He knew Rosario. He knew Milano. knew all those guys in Terminal Island with him. Yeah. Alba was a drug dealer, you know, and Alba thought like, okay, I can get out of this and get into John scams. But what I think Alba realized when, when John finally sold off the scam he was involved in, Alba got virtually no money. Um, and not that Alba wasn't dabbling in drugs from the moment he got home. He was. He was having ecstasy made in China and sent back home. Well, you know, I was a kid in my 20s. You know, so Alba comes to me with some boats of ecstasy and says, Derek, can you sell these? Well, I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. You know, I'm hanging out with the Gambinos. Yeah. I got ecstasy. So I start selling ecstasy for Alba. You know, I thought I was Al Capone. The truth <laughs> was, <laughs> I it. was an idiot kid. But it didn't really matter what the truth was. That's what I started doing. Um, got it. Eventually, my father got out of jail. Yeah. Um, and he had state time to do, so he sent to New York. The family moved me back there um, to give a house for him to come, you know, parole to. And he got out and went to Bruno's Restaurant, another mob hangout in New York. Yeah. Um, and Bruno's Albanian. The Kosovo War was going on. He said, look, John, I know Derek needs something to do. Let's send him over there and start an insurance company. And that was, you know, right up my dad's alley. And so I took off from the drugs and went over to Kosovo and lived there for two and a half years. Holy cow. Okay. <laughs> Random, but okay. So now, so now you go to Kosovo, you do your thing, you have your insurance company. Then you come back, right? And then, you know, obviously you get, we're going we're gonna to push the book, but don't give too much away. But then what happened next? Because like, that's what I'm saying. I want to get how you like you got into this to, to the white collar scam how did that happen was it intentional was it you know did you do it and think like i'm not gonna get caught i'll get out or was it did you go in honestly and then you kind of you know <laughs> mired over to the left and to the right you know what happened there in terms of you're getting jammed up so this is the beauty about the crimes the new form of organized crime yeah. and i'll talk about it in regards to kosovo you're like i went to kosovo because i was a young crazy kid you know it satisfied all my street urges where at the same time i, I thought i was involved in something legitimate well yeah. halfway through i recognized this is another one of my father's scams you know and by the way our albanian partners also realized that um meanwhile IBTR, which was another pump and dump my brother and father were involved in. Uh, they used me as a signature, but I was going on in New York. So, you know, they, they kind of put, you know, Derek away in Kosovo, let him go fight the war. And, you know, we'll, we'll uh, pump and dump here. The pump and dump goes bad. My dad's sure he's going to go to jail. Forbes puts a new article out called The Long Arm of John Galanis. By the way, they're totally right about everything in the article. Um, and, uh, my father decides he's got to take off and go on the run. So my father is on the run living in Greece, which is right below Kosovo. I'm going down there shoveling money. He's going over and seeing the Gambinos in Sicily. Tony's over there courting some girl that he eventually married. And he actually sent Tony to Kosovo to see me. You know, and I'll never forget, you know, Tony says to me, look, Hey, Derek, I want to open an ice cream bar, you know, in Sicily, we could do this. Yeah. And I looked at him and, you know, my mind was just fried then. For my, so, and, you know, Gambino asking me for money was, so I looked at him and said, I'm not giving you a dime. And I sent him back to Sicily. And I know my father sent him there because he thought that I would come off the money for him. But I was living around a bunch of dangerous Albanians 24-7. You know, Gambino yeah. asking me for money wasn't going to happen. Um, in any event, eventually the insurance business implodes on itself my father made so many enemies with our albanian partners and everything else it explodes i return to san diego and unfortunately i return right into a dea drug investigation that's going on surrounding dennis alba's ecstasy lab unreal so your first pitch was for the ecstasy yeah my first pitch was for the ecstasy. and here's the thing i mean you gotta appreciate like so yeah. they know time by the way i so i'm in San Diego for a little while. Yeah. And then I go with my brother back to New York. We're circling some other like uh, stop, pump and dump deal or whatever there. And we meet Tommy and I believe it was the Soho area of New York. And uh, I hit him up because Dennis asked me to. I say, hey, Tommy, uh, you know, listen, you know, Dennis got that lab going. Um, if we can get, you know, channels back here for distribution, we can make a lot of money. And Tommy looks at me and he smiles. He goes, I look around for you, Derek. And so I, I take that as a you know positive side. I run out of the bar, call Alba. I go, hey, Dennis. I go, Dennis, 
I got financing for both things. You know, we were in some porn thing and, and the ecstasy lab. And the yeah. DEA was listening the whole time. So when we all got swooped up, their entire focus was on Gambino. Because, you know, they're mafia royalty. I mean, the Gambino family and the public doesn't seem to realize it. They think of the Gambino oh, crime yeah. family. The Gambinos took over the Gambino crime yeah, family. I yeah, mean, yeah, they yeah. went from Sicily and they were in charge of it. I mean, Frank Callahan married into it. Yep. John was on the commission. I mean, they are the Gambinos, literally. Yep. Yep. Um, but yeah, so so they leaned on me hard. I mean, fortunately for me, they were constrained statutorily to 20 years because it was my first offense. And your first offense, because ecstasy wasn't coke and it wasn't speed, and mandatory minimums have become so unpopular, there was no mandatory minimum. And because it was a new drug, I was constrained to 20 years on my first offense. But believe me, they tried to give me 20. Wow. And then, okay, so we do hear respectfully, and it's not beating anybody up, but there were guys that did we that were in your shoes that flipped, right? And you can argue you weren't a made guy. You weren't like a hardcore associate. You were friends with these guys. You liked these guys. But like you could have you could have took Witsack and moved on and not do a day. What made you stand up? For Obviously you did. But what made you stand up, Derek? No, you know, listen. So uh, first of all, internal things are the only thing that do that, you know. Our yeah. own wherewithal and how we see the world. Yeah. From my perspective, I was raised with the Gambino kids. Yeah, I was absolutely. raised as my father's son. You know, my yeah. father taught me about rats being scum from the time I was a little kid. Rats are scum. My uncle was a rat on my father. Rats are scum. Everything in me said rats are scum. So I, you know, I that was my perspective. And by the way, yeah. my father also taught me the government does illegal things, the government scumbags. And by the way, they did plenty of illegal things. They they invaded my mother's house while I was sitting in MCC San Diego to try to make me think it was the Gambinos to try yeah. to finally flip me. You know, and and by the way, they, you know, they don't they not they never get in trouble for those things. Let's let's imagine that a street cop found the DEA in my mom's home doing that. They would simply say, ah, yeah, we we're investigating. And then yeah. maybe I would have gotten a, a sentence beat down to like five years or something. Like yeah. nothing ever happens to them. There's no repercussions. Yeah. Um, and so it seemed all the lessons my father taught me about how corrupt and scummy the government is were all, all absolutely legitimate. So, you know, it just it just m made me dig in more and more like, yeah, these these guys, I, I hate them. And, you know, listen, I'd have I'd have done life. You could have put me to death. I wouldn't have told on Tommy. I wouldn't have told on my brother. I wouldn't have told on my father. And they all knew about the drugs and they were all involved to varying degrees. You know, um, but, you know, listen, it was my honor, my pride, the way I was raised. Now, listen, I will tell you this. Yeah. I learned a valuable lesson there that. I was the patsy. You know, I was the fool in their minds. I mean, none of those guys uh, reached out to help me after that. I mean, I got out and they ripped me off again. But that, that's well, a whole okay. I, I don't want to. I don't want to gloss over that because I look in your old interviews or old in your other interviews because we're all new. But your other interviews, you stood up, you know, ten toes, a ten toes down, and you um, did your time. You come out. So you're like, hey, you know, I, I care about you a lot. I didn't roll. I stood up. I lost 10 years of income, maybe starting a family, being away from my family, whatever that is. And you came out. Walk us through that a little bit because I was really surprised to hear that. Sure. So, you know, like my delusion, and I, of course, I outlined this in the book. How could I not? My delusion was, you know, I, I had been, you know, my stature in the family was just raised, like. Now everybody sees yeah. that Derek, the man of honor, you know, Derek's right. like Rosario. Derek will take one on the chin. You can't break Derek. And by the way, the prosecutors got that message because, you know, 20 years later, when I caught another case, the prosecutor in San Diego, Todd Robinson, told the prosecutor, Brian Blaze in New York, he goes, you're never going to break a Galanis. You can try, but wow. you're never going to do it. They make mafia guys look like, you know, that's, that, uh, that's that Greek blood. That's that yeah. Greek blood. And, and yes, stubbornness. And, you know, like for me, I got out and I'm thinking, OK, you know, they're going to respect yeah. me more and we'll get things done. But I was yeah. the same guy. And, you know, we, we committed another scam. You know, we pumped and dumped Jerova Financial like my brother through a SPAC 
had gotten uh, control of a sh- effectively what was a shell on the New York Stock Exchange. Now, forget the fact that the money went back to the investors. It didn't matter. If you have a shell, an empty shell in New York Stock Exchange, you right. got something that can be monetized pretty hard. And yeah, and that's what he did. He put in a bunch of bogus insurance companies from the Bahamas or Bermuda yeah. or whatever, and he pumped and dumped it. We we made like $20 million off of that. And I had the nerve to say, hey, you know, guys, uh, what's my what's my share? And uh, they they took great umbrage at my nerve of asking what my share might be. Wow. So then so then you obviously that happens. Now you wanted is this was this situation when you just wanted your end and they yeah. kind of gave you the runaround? That that's it. I mean, probably at the time what I would have done, because I realized I was in bed with scumbags. I probably would have just taken my end and gone and opened up a martial arts school, you know, gone off and done something that I knew how to do. Um, But, you know, unfortunately, my end wasn't coming. You know, their view of my end was the chump change, not making it small money. Right. But the chump change they gave me during the scam, which was probably around twelve thousand a month. You know, and I'm not laughing at twelve thousand a month, but I was living in San Francisco. Right. Um, And, you know, when you when you look at the overall scam and i told them this at the time i said listen guys i'm going to do the same amount of time in jail as you guys do you can't do this to me right, well right. they couldn't they did okay but it gets better well, not better i don't mean to say better I'm, I'm like they're trying to kill you good good job guys no no where it gets interesting Derek. i'm sorry where it gets interesting these same guys who your father and brother and remember they're around people who could make it happen we all know that right respectfully right they wanted you dead. What happened there, man? That's crazy. So I guess they were so upset that I had dared to ask for money that they were discussing what their moves were, right? Like, what do we do now? You know, the, the guy wants his money. Uh, my father proffered to my brother, well, we can kill him. And my brother, I guess, mulled that over and said, I don't know. What if he stands up? What if he lives? You know, and, and they, they decided not to go out. Now, what a lot of people ask me is, well, how do you know that happened, Derek? Yeah. Well, let me give you a little glimpse in the future without spoiling anything. Yeah. We're sitting on trial for the Drova case six years later, which I knew we would. By yeah. the way, I got the same time that my father got, just like I I knew I would. Um, and my brother comes to me and says, hey, you know, Derek, uh, I, I want to let you know what happened with dad. And, you know, I stopped it. And, you know, because, you know, this never should have been discussed. We never should have done that. And, you know, I apologize. Wait, don't say he showed up on tapes and stuff. Say again. Like, don't say he came to you because you were going to find out through discovery. Or did he well, say no. that to Hedge? I'm going to give you the reason he came to me. Oh, so, no. you know, my, what, my brother, what, my, what my brother was doing was, okay, what he's been taught his whole life is there's got to be someone to take the blame. There's got to be a fall guy, which I fit that that mold many times for them. Yeah. I tried to on that case for them too, but the feds weren't having it because I didn't get make any money, right? Um, so my 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 brother decides dad's got to go away. You know, dad's better in prison anyway. We'll stick him in prison, and he can still act as consigliere and everything else. But he's got to go to prison. Um, the problem was, and my 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 brother just didn't conceptualize this. Is no matter what he was going down because. The, the, with financial fraud, the end game stops where the money stops. My dad yeah. got a couple million bucks out of that, but my brother got most of it. So the feds are going to go after my brother, not my dad. But right. my brother was telling me that to try to convince me to become a witness against my dad in the same manner my brother was doing at the time. Like my brother was blaming everything to the feds on my father. And by the way, the feds know my father's a scumbag, but they Wait, couldn't really, get over brother, the money. Brother, hold on, hold on. Your brother discusses with your father to kill you and then rolls on your father? Yeah. I, <laughs> listen, this, how do I, okay. So people want to know, well, well, yeah, they want to know why the street's gone. The street's gone because sociopaths like my father and brother will rule everything. You know, it's like Sammy. He'll shoot you and then he will go tell on you. So if there's no system, there's no real guts to America and there really isn't anymore. You know, it's a free for all, you know? Yeah. Wow. You know, I I knew your story. I knew your stuff. Um, What we're going to do and you guys are going to kill me. We're going to end it here. I'm going to tell you why. We're going to get the book. We're going to read the book 
and then I'm going to have a lot more questions. I, 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 I knew this was going to be good. And uh, I kind of want to leave everybody's appetite a little, little hungry, wet your beak a little bit. So Derek, in the meantime, we'll, uh, we'll follow up in a few weeks after I'm done with the book. Give uh, everybody how they could find you. I'll put a link for the book below for people on iTunes. It, uh, it'll be in the description for audio people, but how can we find you Derek? Yeah, so, I mean, look, my books, both of them, uh, Greed and Fear of the Galanis Crime Family and Warrior of the Light, A Fighter's Journey Through the Rise of Mixed Martial Arts, are both on Amazon. So with my name, Derek Galanis, you can find them. Um, as far as me talking, and, and a lot of people love my videos, and I know reading yeah. isn't the most popular thing with technology today. Uh, I'm on TikTok. Uh, my crime yeah. TikTok is at Derek Meyer Galanis. My fight game TikTok, which includes martial arts, boxing, everything, is at Derek Galanis. Uh, I, I merge both of those accounts on Instagram to at Derek Galanis. Um, you guys can also find me on Facebook at Derek Meyer Galanis if there's any questions. Beautiful. And then kind of like a, where are they now? Is your father incarcerated or is he out? So <laughs> my oh, yeah. brother's incarcerated in okay. the biggest club fed that still remains, Pensacola, Florida. He spent, ironically, uh, three or four years in Terminal Island, which was the nexus for all these crimes, including the Exxon case. Then he got transferred there. He got transferred because my father got out on Trump's law. And here's the here's the most amazing part. Did about your father use first step? The first yes, step? step? Yeah. Yeah, and let me so let me say this. So this my father had a lower criminal history level than I did um, because my father had been in jail so long, a lot of his criminal history went away. So I had a higher criminal history at my my Jerova uh sentencing than my father did. Um so yeah, it's just comedy how it all works out. Wow. Um your second stint, that was another nine years. So my second stint. I signed for eight to 10. Um, now, God bless the state of New York. They're very liberal in sentencing. The rest of the country is not. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, they gave me six years. They went below the guidelines. That only happens in New York. I can tell you this. As I went back across the country, I was expecting to be able to, people to be happy for me. They were all livid. You know, everyone was convinced I got a 5K1. I said, it's not a 5K1, oh, guys. In, in New York, they sentence below the guidelines. It's like you get a break and then uh, you can't yeah. win. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Uh, this was a good one. I uh, I got like uh, my hair and my neck is standing up. So listen, Derek, thank you for being on the show. We're going to put links to the book below. Um, we're going to put links to his social media. Uh, those that watch on the, on the rebound and those that watch on iTunes. And uh, Derek, thank you so much for being on uh, the Armchair NBA, brother. Anytime, Tom. You tell me when to come back. We'll do it again. There's a lot more, and there's a lot more politicos involved with the mafia. I love it, brother. Pretty good. <laughs>